All right, so why don't we get started? So good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Bellicoz. I'm the head of adult programming at Wilton Library. And I'm very pleased to be introducing this lecture series, which is made possible with the support of the literary series in memory of Amy Quigley. Quick program note, just I'm sure you noticed this, but just so that everybody is, uh, is reminded, uh, we've got six sessions lined up and they are every other week. I only mention that because in previous series, we've tended to do things on a weekly basis. So this one's every other week and gives us a little more time to read things in between. And uh, just to remind everybody of that. A uh, quick program note, as far as the library is concerned, um, we've got a series coming up that starts in two weeks, poetry series being done by our friend Judson Scruton. And he's going to be doing four weeks on uh, Robert Penn Warren, a uh, major figure in 20th century literature and poetry. Um, and uh, that's in person only in the library. And it's on Thursday mornings at 1030. And it starts in two weeks. So we'd love it if you'd like to come to that. Those are always really good interactive seminars. The last thing I want to mention is something I discovered this afternoon when, when going to read Lancelot and Elaine. Um, there's, a, there's an entity out there in the world of the Internet called LibriVox. It's a company that produces uh, uh, e-books and e-audio books that are in public domain. And I just want people to know that I've discovered that the entire Idols of the King is on LibriVox. So I actually listened to someone read uh, Lancelot and Elaine this afternoon. So you can go find that. It's easy with a Google search. You put in Idols of the King LibriVox and you'll land right on it. Okay, so a quick tweak to what we usually do. Um, because this is really setting the stage in an introductory uh, fashion for the entire series, Mark needs every minute he can get. So this particular session will not have any Q&A part. Uh, there will be Q&A in the future the way we've done it. But tonight, Mark's going to go straight through. Um, of course, he's always happy to answer questions from, from emails that you can email him directly. And if you need his email address and don't have it yet, just ask me and I'll, I'll send it over to you. Right. It's uh, changed over the from the spring. People need to know it's changed from the spring since I'm no longer at Yale. Right. He's uh, because Mark's no longer at done. Yale and he's got a he's got an, his own website. Uh, he's got a different email address. So if I you've emailed email him recently, that. that's fine. If you haven't emailed him in a while, just shoot me one and I'll send his email address back to you. Uh, looking over the sign up list, I think we're all pretty familiar with Mark's illustrious background and his literary resume. So I'm going to dispense with the long intro and bio and we'll just get started. So, Mark. Thank you. Let me begin again by thanking Michael, not as I always do for inviting me, but for having what I'll call the courage to let me do a kind of academic program. Uh, I dare to say I don't think there are many public libraries in Connecticut or maybe in the country that are doing a multi-part series on Idols of the King. Credit for that goes to Michael, not to me. And uh, yes, I am going to talk straight through. Uh, I hope not to be talking at you. I hope you will find this interesting. There's a lot of information to cover. Future sessions will be much more interactive. There's a lot of history tonight, uh, even though this series is not about history. This series about, is about a great poem and its relationship to Victorian culture in its moment and its relationship to medieval culture looking back. I hope you will learn a lot tonight in the 50 or so minutes I have left, and I hope you will admire the poem as a poem uh, or at least if you don't like the experience of reading it, and I hope you'll do that aloud. I hope you'll like the cultural context that I'm going to present tonight. Uh, it is one of the great long poems in English, and England and other countries have a tradition of writing long poems. Uh, Arthur was of interest to many writers, including Dante. Milton seriously thought of having his 16th, uh, 17th century epic be about Arthur rather than the fall of the Garden of Eden, and he changed his mind late in the day. Arthur is a very influential figure in Western civilization. So a few things to know. Arthur gets solidified in a work by a Welsh cleric named Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, the Latin title translates to History of the Kings of Britain, 
published around 1136, that is 12th century. Uh, Jeffrey decided that when he didn't have the right material, he made things up. So he was interested in creating a history that would be a good read. And it was in the 12th century that Guinevere starts to make her appearance in different versions of the story when she wasn't known to be a literary figure the five or 600 years before. Um, Arthur dates from the fifth or sixth century. And later in the 1100s, a uh, French poet, uh, Chrétien de Troyes, T-R-O-Y-E-S, writes his romances in French, uh, and that begins the florid language, the courtly love, what you might call the furniture of Camelot. Uh, it's not dreamy, but it's pretty, it's sentimental, even though the stories are still dark. Remember, Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, which comes out in 1485, probably posthumously, late 15th century, means the death of Arthur. So uh, before the epic even begins, you know it's going to end badly. And in all the medieval versions, it ends badly. In, um, uh, in Tennyson's version, it ends badly because the story of Camelot is about the audacity and uh, uh, admirable attempt to create a perfect social society. And it's being done in a Christian context, which means it can't succeed. So the fall of Camelot is the fall of man, is the fall of the Garden of Eden. Falling, going down, descending, occurs often in the poem. It's not that they were wrong to try, it's that they were wrong to think it would be successful. So the Mort d'Arthur comes out in 1485. We think the guy who did it is Mallory. We don't know a whole lot about him. It was the only major work of English literature published between Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which is 1400, so nearly 100 years earlier, and Shakespeare, which is in the 15, late 1500s. There's a big patch of nothingness between 14. 100 Canterbury Tales and let's say 1600 for Shakespeare. And the only thing of merit is uh, Mort d'Arthur. <clears throat> now, if you read the handout, uh, the talk that uh, David gave you today, <clears throat> that I wrote about Mallory being more of an editor and a collector and Tennyson being a poet, I want to emphasize that Tennyson was not only a great poet, he revised endlessly. And David, if you'll put up on the screen, uh, the passage from uh, Tennyson where Lancelot is talking about his reaction to the letter and then what follows. I'll just make a, a brief comment. Uh, you got that as a handout so you can keep it with you after the session and you can do some of the work of what I would ordinarily be doing in the session after the session. So we're going to look at Tennyson's poetry. It's written in, uh, did you hear me, Michael, about we're going to screen share that? Yes. Yes, I was just going to say that I'll, right. I'll do it. I'll do it as long as you start calling me Michael instead of David. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. how, about, how about if I call you Arthur? Would that impress you? <laughs> sorry. I apologize for that. No so, problem. No problem at all. So the poetry is in blank verse. So blank verse is unrhymed iambic pentameter. So if we could go down, yeah, and stop there. Anywhere is fine. So... Iambic pentameter, 10 syllables to a line, every other one gets a beat. ba 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 ba, -ba, -ba. The time of year thou mayst in me behold. It's very uh, congenial with English. It's very much the rhythm of uh, English language. Uh, people think that the 10-syllable, five-beat line is a kind of breath. And it's unrhymed iambic pentameter, which is known as a blank verse blank of rhyme, because it's used for epic poetry, for contemplative poetry, for philosophical arguments. It's high poetry. So before we go on, I have to say something you have to understand about Tennyson is what you need to understand about Cervantes and F. Scott Fitzgerald. There's a trio for you. Cervantes loved the romances that he read as a young man even though he knew that they were sentimental and phony and they didn't inculcate um, courage and virtue. They were sort of a waste of time, like teen magazines. And what he did is he wrote a great epic, Don Quixote, 
in which a man loves those romances, lives out those romances in his madness, you get everything you would want to get from a courtly uh, uh, chivalric romance epic, except that at the end, uh, Don Quixote realizes he has to reject that. But he doesn't reject it until you spend several hundred pages reading about it. There aren't dragons, there are windmills, there are substitutes for greatness. But what Cervantes did is he had his epic and he ate it too. If we skip to F. Scott Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald was intoxicated by the jazz age. He loved flappers and cars and the speediness of everything, even though he knew it was corrupting. And he wrote a great American novel. We didn't talk about it because we did a different Fitzgerald novel recently, The Great Gatsby. And the issue in The Great Gatsby is that Nick Carraway is the moral center of the book. But you don't come from Nick Carraway, you come for Gatsby, who not only gets rejected, but murdered in the book, even as Fitzgerald himself loves the Keatsian language that he writes in, lots of adjectives, lots of sensual expression. You remember the scene where Daisy is shown all the different expensive shirts and colors uh, that Gatsby is throwing out of his wardrobe from an upper level. And she says, they're so beautiful, I could cry. There's a portion of um, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and certainly Zelda in that kind of hyperbolic, hyper-romanticized love of stuff, of wealth, of speed, even as he wants to write a novel that criticizes it. So he writes The Great Gatsby, where you get both. Tennyson, from an early age, was enamored of the Arthurian legends. He's living in a Victorian society. It's urban. It's industrialized. Uh, the, the chimney sweeps, the, the crossing sweeps, the boys who are given tips to sweep garbage out of the way at a crossing are not sweeping litter. They're sweeping animal feces and sometimes human feces because the sewers can't keep up with the number of people who are descending on London, who in the 19th century, which in the 19th century become the preeminent city in Europe, surpassing Paris. Um, Tennyson lived in a world of industrialization and citification and soot. And he longed for the beauty of the medieval world. So did many other Victorians. There was a Gothic revival, a revival of medieval stuff in the early 19th century. It could not have happened earlier because the Gothic is Roman Catholic. And in the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, you didn't make friends if you wrote about the Roman Catholic Church. Um, Henry VIII had made a new religion. He established himself as a monarch with no deference to Rome. Uh, Catholics could not attend um, Oxford or Cambridge. Catholics could not vote until the 19th century when romanticism, the romanticism that celebrated the supernatural and the imagination, made it that you could actually now allow Roman Catholics to hold office and to go to university. Um, so Tennyson's not responsible for that shift, but he benefits from it. And he wants to write a poem about what's wrong with his world by looking at a story he loved. And he is going to be florid and sentimental and um, self-serving in terms of he has a beautiful ear for poetry. Uh, uh, Lancelot is going to ride in the diamond joust, which Arthur had ordained. And by that name, had named them since a diamond was the prize. That kind of echoing, that kind of incantation, ride for the diamond and the diamond joust, which Arthur had ordained, and by that name had named them since a diamond was a prize. Later on, <clears throat> when Elaine says, you should wear my favor, you should take my scarf, uh, and he says, Lancelot, I'm paraphrasing, Lancelot, wear fair lady's favor in the field, never such my won't as those who know me know. And she says, Lance, if you want to be somebody else, if you want to win not on your reputation, what better way than to wear my kerchief? And he says, good idea, Elaine. And when he goes, his kinsmen who are in the stands say, this guy must be Lancelot. This guy whose face we can't see, whose shield is not Lancelot's shield, he must be Lancelot. And one of them says, 
Lancelot wear fair ladies' favor in the field? Never such is wont, as we who know him know. Completely repetitive, in, in, impossible in, in its coincidence, but that's the nature of medieval literature. That harmonizing, that repetition, it's a kind of incantation. So Tennyson writes a verse about a, a, a poem, about a world that he admires and loves, but he knows is terribly flawed, and he wants to use it as a cautionary tale to Victorian England, which we will get to further on. If you took time to read side by side the Mallory in the modern English that you could understand and read, no, no, I want to stay on, I want to stay on Tennyson. Um, when, uh, go up a little bit more, I'm sorry, I want to see a little bit more of it. Okay, then said, I'm sorry, let's scroll up so I can read lower down on the screen. Right, so the queen interrupts to say, then said the, the queen, and in parentheses, it says, sea was her wrath, yet working after storm. There's nothing about the queen's mood or manner in Mallory. He's not interested in such things. But Tennyson's a poet. And that's a beautiful metaphor. Her wrath was like the sea, but working after the storm. That, that's such a beautiful, concise metaphor. It's original uh, to to um, Tennyson. If you let us see more of that paragraph, Michael, he answers, Queen, she would not be content, save that I wedded her, which could not be. Then might she follow me through the world, she asked, it could not be. There's a lot more explanation in um, in Ma Mallory. And then if you look up, don't move, don't move it, um, Michael, if you look up, where she says, I can bring in testimony uh, that as much as I tried to break the spell, I wasn't able to. He says, um, her father, who himself besought me to be plain and blunt and used to break her passion, some discourtesy against my nature, what I could, I did. There's nothing with that succinct power, those five words in Mallory. I'm not blaming Mallory, he's not a poet, but that what I could, I did is the hallmark of a great poet. There's a lot of language, a lot of adjectives, a lot of narrative, a lot of scene setting, but the power of Tennyson is what I could, I did, or the time is hard at hand. So that's one of the major differences between reading a poem of this and reading uh, a prose work. So Mallory, publishes his work in 1485, which is on the eve of the Renaissance. And why does he do this? It's just 30 years after the fall of Constantinople. Constantinople was the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Uh, and when uh, the Turks of the Ottoman Empire destroyed the Byzantine Empire, which was a version of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire ended in Europe and Asia. And what happened from 1450 on was the Renaissance. And with the Holy Roman Empire, with the, the Roman Empire gone, you can't call them nations yet. Nations don't come into being until the 19th century. But these areas that want to have a, a coherent demographic and cultural identity, they are going to fill the void left by the, the end of the Roman Empire, and they are going to want to say, you know, we're Britons, or we're Franks, the French people, or we're Romans. And in fact, all of the material about Arthur is collectively known, the legend, the history, the myth, as the matter of Britain. I know it sounds odd, but an influential scholar said, uh, really, the only thing that matters to an intellectual man are the three great matters of Europe. The matter of Britain, Arthur. The matter of France, Charlemagne, Song of Roland. And the matter of Rome, that is Greek and Rome as the classical empire. And so those bodies of work come into being to backfill the absence of the Roman Empire and to try to make a patriotic literature. And so Arthur becomes a hero of Britain 
even though he well may not have existed. And part of his strength is that he has the courage, audacity, vision to try to make a world of perfection. He himself is too good to be true. Um, Guinevere's issue with him is that he's passionately perfect, uh, that he is too good to be a good king. Um, and that's part of the fall of Camelot, that uh, Arthur doesn't pay attention to the corruption around him. But what Mallory is doing is he's trying to create a myth for Britain. Fast forward 400 years to Tennyson, and Tennyson is trying to take a well-beloved story, a well-known story, and give it a Victorian spin. It's already dark. It's dark to begin with. The death of the death of Arthur tips that hand. Uh, and so when you read these poems, one thing to be aware of is how fragile and precious civilization is. There's a great fear of the primitive, the savage, the uncivilized. The Romans called the German and Goth tribes from the north barbarians because they were mocking them by saying they don't speak Latin. They babble. Bob, 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 barbarian. Barbarian comes from the same root as babble and baby. The problem with the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, name your Goth, the Germans, the Franks, is that they're not civilized because they don't speak Latin. And they mock them with that word baby talk, which became our barbarian. In the poem, be very sensitive to how much the fear of the primitive animates the poem. It's worth noting that the word heathen, and you may remember that Arthur knows that even though he was victorious in casting out the heathen, apparently there's a prophecy that they're going to come back. Um, and they're back. Read the newspaper. Um, uh, you may not know that the word heathen comes from heath. Heathens are the people who live in the heath. That is, they don't live in the city, which is where we get the word civilization and citizen from. Pagan is not just someone who doesn't believe in religion. The root of pagan is the same root as pays in French or paisan in Italian. It's country. Uh, a pagan is someone from the country, somebody rustic, somebody uneducated, someone unsophisticated. In the poem, be sensitive to when people are engaging with the savage, the primitive, when Lancelot finds that he's in a wilderness or a wild. The waste is the word that Tennyson often uses like a wasteland. The wasteland comes into prominence in the next idol, the Holy Grail. And so if we look at how the diamonds came to be uh, in this idol, I'm just going to read you that passage where very early in the idol, which begins in medias res, Latin for the middle of things, it begins with being with Elaine when she already has the shield, and then it backs up. That's an epic uh, uh, method uh, from the Greeks and Roman um, to suggest that you will capture your audience's interest if you begin in the middle and say, let's find out how this happened. And it's been very successful. So after that line, uh, road to tilt for the great diamond and the diamond joust, which Arthur had ordained, and by that name had named them since a diamond was a prize. If you think I'm overselling this, when you're offline tonight, read that aloud to somebody in your household and see if it's not a hit. So we're told for Arthur, long before they crowned him king, roving the trackless realms of lioness. Trackless means it's uncivilized. It doesn't have roads. It doesn't even have paths. Had found a glen, gray boulder, and blank tarn. That's the landscape. A field, a gray boulder, and a black swamp. A horror lived about the tarn and clave like its own mist to all the mountainsides. So that's a wasteland. That's a spooky place. For here, two brothers, one king, one a king, had met and fought together like one of the idols that we're not reading, Balin and Balan. And each had slain the brother at a blow and down they fell and made the glen abhorred. And there they lay till all their bones were bleached and lichened the moss is working on into color with the crags. 
And he that once was king, one of the two men as a king, was a king, had on a crown of diamonds, one in front and four aside. And Arthur came and laboring up the pass, all in a misty moonshine, unawares had trodden that crown skeleton and the skull broke from the nape. Well, that's icky, as my daughter would say. And from the skull, the crown rolled into light and turning on its rims, fled like a glittering rivulet to the tarn. This swamp is lit up by this gleaming rivulet of diamonds. And down the shingly scour he plunged and caught and set it on his head and in his heart heard murmurs, lo, thou likewise shalt be king. This is not a good moment for Arthur. This is uh, Lord, of the, uh, Lord of the Rings, my precious. Uh, there's no antipathy on his part for the fact that he broke this guy's neck, didn't know it was there, and eagerly picks up the, the crown and now wants to share the diamonds with his knights. That he wants to share his diamonds with his knight is not commendable. What is the origin of these diamonds? They're blood diamonds. You know that phrase from diamonds that are mined from uh, countries uh, that are war-torn and uh, that have blood in their ancestry. They, they come from violence. Uh, this is a cursed crown, and Arthur has no hesitation to run down and get it because he wants everything for the glory of his knights. He gets no credit in Tennyson's view or mine, for the fact that he wants to share them with his knights. They're his knights. And he sets up these competitions because he wants the very best people. And the son of a gun, Lancelot wins eight years in a row. And then the crisis happens in the beginning of this poem, where Elaine decides she's too sick to go. And Lancelot, hearing this, thinks he reads, that's the language of the poem, that he reads in her manner that she's basically saying, hey, Lance, don't go. Stay with me. I'm sick. Don't go. Uh, they are in a, a tradition of what's known as courtly love. Courtly love, very conventionally stylized, was the devotion of a man of means, uh, could be money, could be prowess, for a woman who is almost always married, that is desirable. And he is going to devote himself to her purely. I have the strength of 10 because my heart is pure comes from this poem. The love is unconsummated. In most cases, Lancelot and Guinevere went for a different option. What can I tell you? But uh, they clearly uh, are, have a sexual relationship, but that's not the courtly love tradition. And the courtly love tradition is that the physical sexual love of a man for a woman is impossible because one of them is married, the other one is a person of nobility, and what they want to do is they want to make their love something more spiritual. Guinevere and Lancelot don't go that route. There are many different traditions about their relationship, how they met, uh, whether she's abducted and saved. There are different versions of how her life ends up. That's the problem with legend. But the most um, embraced one is that when Lancelot is sent as an emissary by Arthur to collect the queen, she thinks she's seeing Arthur. And so when she falls in love with this impressive man, you may know the movie Camelot. You may have seen the play. Um, uh, if you've seen Spamalot, it's a different take. Um, but she mistakes her emissary for her lord, and uh, things go downhill from there. So Lancelot reads her mood and thinks what she's saying is, stay with me. And it turns out he's completely wrong. And so just a page or two after the Blood Diamond episode is remembered, he makes a mistake. And he thinks she's saying and he quotes what he imagines is in her head, love is more than diamonds. Stay home, stay with me. And Guinevere says, no way in hell. I want you to win that ninth diamond. What the hell have we been doing all these years? And she decides that he should lie to the king to say that he's not well enough to go. So talk about trouble in paradise. A blood diamond, the queen saying, for reasons we don't know, she's too ill to attend. Lancelot misreading her 
And then her saying, no, I want you to lie. And then he says, well, now I've lied to the king. You want me to go in disguise. How am I, how you want me to go? How am I going to explain that I got well enough to go? Well, go in disguise. People won't know it's you. So if you win, it will be on your merit and not your reputation. And then just tell the king, I wanted to do this. And I know you love your knights to be bold and you'll be happy with this. So in the course of just a few pages, there's misreading and lying. Now, before we continue with the lies, in the same way that the wasteland, the idea of uncivilization, of savagery is very important in the poem and stay attuned to it, so is reading. Uh, reading, not just in the sense of reading a text, you read, uh, uh, Elaine reads the dense uh, in Lancelot's shield uh, to know what he's been through. And of course, the shield has a coat of arms that you read. It has information more often visual than language, but sometimes mottos too. You read somebody by their family crest. You read somebody by their colors. The fact that he has a woman's scarf on his sleeve is something that you read. You read almonds in the sky. You read almonds in the land. This is a civilization that believes in the supernatural. And one of the ways you have access to the supernatural is that you read in the book of nature, you read in landscape, you read in people. So if you see something being read, either actually physically reading a letter, the way Arthur reads um, Elaine's letter at the end, and everyone's gathered around and we hear her words addressed to Lancelot, um, in uh, the original, uh, in one version of it, she calls Lancelot most villainous. Uh, she really indicts him with not just being discourteous, but being a villain, uh, a big deal. And a villain, by the way, has the same root as village, V-I-L-L, -L, because there's that same bias against the uncivilized. A villain is someone who doesn't go to town and get class, he stays in the village. It's remarkable how much of history is codified in words. So reading is very, very important. They read in the body language of this unknown knight that it's Lancelot, and they're confused because they know it can't be because he's wearing something he shouldn't be wearing, multiple kinds of reading. Once those various lies and deceptions are introduced, what happens? Gawain, who's given a task by the king. And in, in medieval literature, uh, Gawain's kind of a jerk. He, he's not your best knight. But what does he do? Instead of bringing it uh, uh, to uh, Guinevere, he gives it to Elaine and comes back and says to Arthur, I figured out he knew, she knew where he was. And Arthur is not pleased. And later on, when Arthur hears from Guinevere, oh, what Lancelot did is he pretended to be sick because he wanted to do this thing of hiding his identity so he would win, his own, win on his own merit. Arthur is not pleased. In the Holy Grail, which we will be coming to next, when the knights decide they are going to pick up the burden of Christianity. So in the actual Crusades, a number of non-Christian nations and leaders started to uh, plummet, to, uh, I'm sorry, pillage, um, uh, the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And a number of lords, Christian lords, came nominally to protect uh, the Christian stronghold of the eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. But they knew that there was plunder to be had, and so their, their manner was mixed. In this poem, when Percival, the only one of the knights to finally see the Holy Grail in full, and you may know the Parsifal, P-A-R-S-I-F-A-L, opera and materials. All the other knights want to go from me to -ism. And when Arthur hears this, he is not pleased. Because what he knows is that this roar, either of casting out the Saracen, as they were called, the, the Muslims, or going to win plunder, even if they share it with Arthur, means that they're ignoring their responsibilities as knights of the round table. So this brings us to the three main reasons why Camelot falls. One is 
Lancelot as a knight and Guinevere as a queen break their bow vows to Arthur. They dishonor him. They're unfaithful. They're dishonorable. Uh, Lancelot is upset at the suggestion that he should be rude to Elaine because that's discourteous. Uh, he's sleeping with his king's wife. And so one great wound on Camelot is the perfidy of those two people. One a queen with a uh, obligation to Arthur, one his chief knight. The second reason for the fall of Camelot is the episode of the Holy Grail. That's why these last six that I'm focusing on begin with the blood diamond, the lies, the deceptions, uh, people not doing what they're supposed to be doing, uh, the death of Elaine coming as something they read. What does this mean? What, what, what are we supposed, not just the letter, what are we supposed to read from this barge that's no one's driving and she's dressed like a queen? There's a wonderful poem by Tennyson called The Lady of Shalott, which I recommend to you. It's not based on Mallory. It's based on an Italian short, short story, very short, uh, not 200 words. Uh, and the key of that is that when uh, Gwen uh, when uh, Elaine comes into Camelot on the Thames, which comes into the the moat and the castle, they want to read what it is about her. I recommend the Lady of Shalott, a very incantatory poem, a lot of that kind of rhythmic, very heavily rhymed, a beautiful poem about the same idea that. Um, Elaine is doomed. But Tennyson adds a curse of his own creation. He writes in that poem that she's heard that if she looks at Camelot, she'll die. And so she's weaving at a loom and she looks out her window through a mirror. Now, as you can imagine, if she's not a loom, she's working on a screen. Um, if you know about that kind of uh, work, you tie the yarn from behind the panel that you are creating, and you need a mirror in front of you so you can see the front of what you're doing. So there's a realistic reason for why she has a mirror. When I was a kid, a TV repairman used to come with hand mirrors that they put on a table. So when they were working at the back of the TV that was like, you know, five feet deep, remember those TVs? They could see the picture uh, with this very uh, untechnological mirror. Uh, what happens in the poem, The Lady of Shalott, this is not a digression, it's related to the point I'm making about Lancelot and Guinevere. She hears um, Lancelot singing, and she le remember, there's a curse on her if she looks to Tamalot. And the poem says she left the web, the web of her weaving, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room. She saw the water lily bloom. She saw the helmet and the helmet plume. And she looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Why? Because she cannot bear the real beauty of Lancelot. She is struck to death by how impressive she is. She has been living, we're told in this poem, the idols in a fantasy. Well, Tennyson would say the entire civilization of Camelot is living in a fantasy. They're looking at things through mirrors, they're misreading, and they are unpreparing themselves for the war that's, uh, that's going to come. So the third reason for the fall, so the deception, dishonor, uh, unfaithfulness of the queen and Lancelot, the uh, Knights uh, abandoning their responsibility to Camelot and the Round Table. And the third is Arthur is inhumanly good. He is clueless about what's going on about him. Uh, he's called a child, uh, not to his face, but to Lancelot uh, by, um, by uh, Guinevere. And she says it's not possible for anyone like that to be loved. Um, he is all fault who has no fault at all. He is no fault who has no fault at all, is a line from this poem. He's a moral child without the craft to rule. He is not savvy. He is 
of foolishly good and accepting. And that's the third reason for the fall. And if you apply this to the Victorian age, um, the Victorians had an expression that they wanted to dedicate themselves to the useful and the good, that they wanted to be practically useful. They had a great distrust of the supernatural world because they wanted to be modern. They wanted to be scientific. They wanted to believe that there was an afterlife, but they couldn't. All the predictions, prophecies in the Bible are being undercut by geology, which says the Genesis story can't be true. They want to believe in the Christian message, but they can't find themselves believing that a man could walk on water or rise from the dead. That's a great trauma in the period when the question is, um, is Nietzsche right when he says at the end of the 19th century that God is dead? And he says it in German, which is much more emphatic. Gott ist tot. Many people believed that there was no God, there was no afterlife, but they wanted to believe in an afterlife. So you get a work uh, mid-century in, in the 1830s, A Christmas Carol, called A Christmas Carol. It has staves like A Christmas Carol. It's published in the Christmas season. It's packaged as a holiday gift. It takes place on Christmas Eve. Four spirits show up, his ex-partner, and three spirits that have nothing to do with Jesus, the Old or New Testament. There is only one reference to the Redeemer, not by Christ, but he who made the lame men walk. When Tiny Tim is asked by his family, does it embarrass you? Does it make you feel self-conscious when you go to church services? He says, no, I hope it makes people remember he who made the lame walk. But he doesn't get named. And no uh, biblical figure shows up to visit Scrooge. Why? What is it that terrifies Scrooge? There's no suggestion that if he doesn't repent, doesn't reform, he'll go to hell. What's the punishment he fears? People will talk ill of him after he's dead. It is a completely earthbound, secular worry. That's the Victorian age. One of the Victorian mottos is, honesty is the best policy. What does that mean? An honest butcher, if that's your policy, it'll help business. It's good for business to be honest. Not because Jesus wants you to be honest, not because the Ten Commandments want you to be honest, not because it'll make you feel good about yourself, it'll make you money. That is a very strong component, utilitarianism. And it sickens Tennyson, who was bred on the nobility, the high aims of Camelot in his reading. And so even though he knows Camelot is doomed, there's a part of him that's pointing in that direction that is there anything really wrong with being courteous, with being self-sacrificing? Is there anything wrong if you cannot embrace religion, at least embrace a kind of grace, a nobility of spirit? And it breaks his heart that he sees that nowhere in England by the 1850s, 60s, 70s, when he's writing these poems. But at the same time, he is completely enamored of his own ability to write beautiful language. And if you can keep those po polarities, that tension in mind, you will enjoy the poem better. If you can see that there are passages of extraordinary beauty in a poem where things are going to go bad very quickly. Um, the other thing I'll say about method, so wasteland, civilization, anti-civilization, reading all different kinds of things to try to make sense of the world. The other thing is uh, the poem is loaded with twos and threes and doubleness. Um, some of this is incantatory. It's just in the language of repetition. So Lancelot and Elaine begins, Elaine the fair, Elaine the lovable, Elaine the lily maid of Astolat high in her chamber, upper tower to the east, guarded the sacred shield of Lancelot, which first she placed where morning's earliest ray might strike it and awake her with the gleam. I'll just point out, I, I could spend too much time doing this, uh, placed and ray and awake all have the long A sound. 
the poem is loaded with nuanced internal rhyme. And that beginning, the fair, the lovable, the lily may, it's, it's like an incantation, almost like a prayer. Later on, there's a reference in a line about 14 lines down to the nesting, nestling in the nest. That's a kind of repetition that would be clunky in a modern poem, but it's intentional. And then we're told that she stripped off the case and read the naked shield, not reading just the images on it, but guessing the pretty history of every dint of sword had made in it. And we're told she lives in a fantasy. Uh, along with the reading and the wasteland and civilization is doubling. Uh, two brothers wind up killing each other in the Blood Diamond episode of this idol. Uh, Balan and Balan wind up doing that. Peleus and Atar, that couple repeat a version of Lancelot and Guinevere. Uh, there's a subplot of an important one with Mark of Cornwall uh, and uh, uh, Tristram and a, a well-known story from Cornwall myth uh, about an illicit love affair and the king, Mark of Cornwall, being savvier than Arthur about what's going on. And uh, I won't spoil that for you, but that's in uh, The Last Tournament, a very powerful doubling, a retelling of the infidelity of Lancelot and Guinevere uh, and Arthur uh, with a much different outcome. It's later in the poem. Sometimes doubling is just a matter of saying something twice, but sometimes a doubling is a reversal. Uh, there's a, I know that Janice is with us this evening. Hi, Janice. There is a chiasmus in this idol, and I won't embarrass Janice by pointing that out, but that is a reversal of pairings when the going get tough, the tough get going, or ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Sometimes a repetition is not a repeating, it's a reversal. It's a turning around. Sometimes the two-ness means a double sense of things, like the double reference to Elaine at the beginning. But sometimes the double uh, creates a problem of opposition, of confusion. Same thing with threes. Sometimes a three, that is the number three, the word thrice, or three things, sometimes the point of that is that it's a great mythical fairy tale number. People think that three has a kind of sacredness, lucky number, um, a Goldilocks and the three bears, because three reflects the fact that the human body is symmetrical. We have most of our body parts in pairs, uh, and we are symmetrically formed. And when you have a left and a right, you also have to have reference to the middle. There's this, there's that, and then there's a famous other thing. So we operate, in a sense, like Goldilocks and the bears, too much, too little, just right. You can go up, you can go down. You can stay still. So sometimes three is just a matter of it sounds good to say something three times. Some incantations have to be repeated three times. Uh, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Um, sometimes it's a matter of um, uh, this idea of three being a reflection of the human experience. Sometimes it's just a crowd. Two's company, three is a crowd. Uh, Lancelot mucks up the doubleness, the pairing of Arthur and his queen. Uh, that's a problem. He's a trespasser. And the three is disruptive. So um, be mindful of doubling. When, when, uh, when Guinevere in her disgust, because she thinks that Lancelot has been faithless because he's wearing fair lady's favor in the field, even show, though she was the one who said, you know what would be good? Ride unknown. And he thinks, at Elaine's suggestion, good idea. I'll wear something I would never wear before. When she throws the diamonds into the Thames, we're told that they rise up to meet them as they fall. That is, the reflection of the diamonds is meeting them as they fall, as if the diamonds are doubled. In The Lady of Shalott, when Elaine is looking, in the mirror, 
and she sees Sir Lancelot. She sees him in the mirror, but she sees his reflection in the moat, the river that's around her her uh, castle. And so Lancelot is reflected, that is reversed in the river mirror, right? If he parts his hair on the left, the guy in the river parts it on the right. And then she sees him in the mirror, which reverses him again. Well, if you see a reversal of a reversal, you see the actual thing. And so the mirror that was protecting her from the thing she sees is undone by the natural mirror of the river. This is good stuff, ladies and gentlemen. This is good stuff. Uh, I recommend that poem to you. And she's done in by reality. Why? Because the entire civilization, without knowing it, is based on unreality, an impossible ideal of Camelot, of courtliness, of courtly love. Um, it's not a problem to be high-minded and to aspire, but you need a king who is savvier than Lancelot is, you, uh, than Arthur is. You need a queen who is faithful to her king and doesn't think of him as a child. You need a champion of the knights to be a person of absolute integrity, and you need the knights to stay home around the round table instead of going out to chase a dream that is more mercenary than it is religious. So be sensitive to the handful of things I've talked about. As we go on through the sessions, I will tell you in advance what to look for in the upcoming session. Keep an eye out for the wasteland. It's uh, hard to miss in um, uh, the Holy Grail. And keep in mind whenever you see figures of doubling, whether repetition or reversal, or three threes of something, uh, the Middle Ages has a great respect for um, supernaturalism, superstition. Um, it wasn't called the Dark Ages for nothing. Now, there were tremendous advancements in, in the time, but the issue was very much uh, having to figure out how the world worked. The last thing I'll say is that um, if you want to know about civilization in terms of philosophy and art and literature, study and read the Greeks. You could do no better. The Greeks really did invent Western civilization. But if you want to know about power, and legality, and law, and empire, and conquest, and geography, you got to go to the Romans. The Romans came afterwards. It's not an accident that when they were making the American nation, people talked about the Romans as a model. Um, uh, Washington was Cincinnatus. They weren't talking about the Greeks. Now, part of that is that a lot of Greek literature was not known at the time that America was being formed. But America's heritage is much more Roman because the Romans were astute at politics and polity. And as empire, the Greeks didn't have the same kind of empire. Uh, they were non-parallel with anyone. So that's a lot in a little bit of time. I want to say again, this was a lot of history. You got some literature moving forward. I intend to talk about the poem as a poem, about the repetition. Uh, Lancelot says in one portion of his poem, known, unknown, known, unknown, known, unknown, um, a kind of sing-song repetition. And what does it mean when Lancelot competes not as himself? This is the last thing I'll say. I see we're coming at the end of time. At the end of Huckleberry Finn, a great novel, Huck falls in a river because there's a, in the river of Mississippi because there's a storm. And when he comes out, he's persuaded to act as Tom Sawyer. Huckleberry Finn is a great moral character. Tom Sawyer plays at things. He's kind of a jerk. Good story if you're a kid, not so much if you're an adult. Uh, in the latter part of Huckleberry Finn, he has been transformed into Tom Sawyer. Uh, because there's mistaken identity, but it happens after he's fallen into a river. It's as if he's been baptized as a new person. When Lancelot has the audacity to remove his name, his shield, his reputation, he's changed. He doesn't know himself. And you'll see that uh, reference to uh, losing himself in uh, the Holy Grail. That's it for me. 
Well, that was uh, that was quite a uh, quite a tour de force there, Mark, and uh, with a lot of information. I have a funny feeling that some of us will be looking at all or parts of the recording. Uh, we hope to have that uh, recording ready, folks, within I don't know a couple of days or maybe the beginning of next week, as we always do, as long as the technology cooperates. And uh, I think this is going to be really, really fascinating. I'm looking forward to the next five. I'm sure uh, all of you are, too. So and, have a and good. Please, please. I'm sorry, Michael, to talk over you, but you are Michael. So that's good. Um, <laughs> please read the poem or portions of the poem out loud. If you have a housemate, roommate, partner who is interested in this at all, read with him or her. It is really a different experience or listen to the recording that Michael referred to, it is really a different experience to read it or have it read to you. It's meant to be heard. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Okay, great. Well, have a good evening, everybody. See you around the library if you're local. And otherwise, we'll see you in a couple of weeks at uh, the next one of these. Thanks very much, Mark. And stay out of trouble, everybody. Stay out of trouble. <laughs>